Hi, this is Wayne Zell and welcome to Blueprint for Wealth, another edition that is designed to help you realize your personal dreams of wealth and freedom, brought to you by Zell Law out of Ruston, Virginia, serving clients all across the country. And today, our special guest is really devoted to the same stuff that I'm devoted to. So it's going to be very interesting, an interesting conversation. Not, I don't have the fake Jason Duncan. I have the real Jason Duncan. Welcome, Jason. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Wayne. It's nice to have you on. So let me give you a little bit of background on Jason. And, uh, and before I do, is there anything, Jason, that you could tell us about what you're doing today that's really hot? Well, I show entrepreneurs how to maximize the value of their company prior to them selling. So I guarantee a 30% increase in valuation in one year in my program. Wow. That is so unusual. So I'm, we're going to dig into that because I don't guarantee anything except to do a good <laughs> job for my clients. Um, so Jason was an unemployed teacher way back in 2010, and now he's an entrepreneurial luminary. Um, first, I'd love for you to share your story of how you evolved from being a teacher and tell us what you were teaching too, because I teach right now in a, in a university and I love to teach. Tell us what you were doing then and how you morphed and transitioned to what you're doing today. So I, um, I was an eighth grade American history teacher. Oh. So I know you're outside DC. Wow. I used to take my students to DC every year and, uh, thoroughly fell in love with, uh, with DC and all there is there. Of course, that was all a long time ago, pre the madness that we've experienced in the last <laughs> eight or 10 years. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> but, uh, but anyhow, um, I was an eighth grade American history teacher. I was tops in the county. Uh, my students scored better on tests, standardized tests than any other teacher in the county in my subject area. But when it came time to make budget cuts due to the Great Recession, I was the guy on the chopping block because I didn't have tenure. I wasn't, I was the last guy hired. So I had to make a decision. What do I'm going to do with the next stage, next chapter of my life? And I made the decision to go into business ownership. So I started a lighting company, built that significantly um, over the next several years, grew a multi-million dollar company. We ended up in Inc. Magazine, Entrepreneur Magazine. And it was like, I can't believe this is my life. This is, this is crazy. But I knew that teaching was the thing I should be doing, like not running a company. Like I'm a teacher. I, I What I didn't tell you is my first 13 years in, in, in my career was a, as pastoral ministry, then teaching. And so here I am as an entrepreneur, I've got 20 or 30 employees. We're working all over the country. I'm making a lot of money. Things are going well, but it's not who I am. So I exited the company and I wanted to exit the traditional way, which is, hey, can I sell this puppy? We have a seven figure bottom line. Surely I can sell it. Nope. Because I had created a business that revolved around me. I was uh, the central figure in the business. So you know that all too well. You didn't create you transferable did. value so that you could that sell is, it. That is correct. And right. I'm not selling myself. I'm not into that. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I tried to figure out another way. And, and through the course of an 18 month period, I slowly stepped out of daily operations, transitioned leadership roles over to my leadership team. And, you know, I was out and I, and so when people started asking, well, did you sell it? I said, no, I didn't sell it. Well, what'd you do? I said, well, I exited without exiting. And so they were like, that's your thing. Exit without exiting. So I ended up writing a book about that. Other people started asking me how to do it, started coaching, started a mastermind and the rest, as they say, is history. Because that is part of the exit planning process. You may, you don't have to sell your company to exit your company. You don't have Correct. to die. You don't have to become disabled. You don't have to sell it to, you know, your employees necessarily. But how, let me ask you a question. As one who didn't exit, but really exited, how did you transition the business and make sure that your managers and your key employees stayed? What was your secret sauce? We had developed over the course of a decade, a very strong culture in the company. And the, the, there were four key leaders in my business at the time that I pulled in at the end of uh, 2019. And I, I sat and had kind of a serious meeting with them all. I said, look, this is, this is what I'm thinking about doing. This is what I want to accomplish. And I want you to, I want you guys to have the company. I want to, I want to eventually let this be your thing. And that was 
that was enough for them to go, okay, we're in. And and by that time they had been, one of them had been with me eight years, another seven, another six and another four. Okay. So like they had been with me a long time at that point. So transferring it was based on years of cultivation of a great culture. So culture was the foundation. How are you going to transfer this to them? Are you going to sell it to them ultimately? Well, that was the plan. And, uh, but COVID had other ideas. And so that company, uh, yeah, there, there's a whole long story. You can, I could lay down on the couch and you could ask me questions. You can walk me through this. <laughs> I am a psychologist <laughs> in my spare, in my spare time. Yeah. But, but no, that, that was the plan. Now, most of our work was done in hospitals ah. and that's what we did all across ah. the country. So in 48 hours at the beginning of COVID, our cash flow went to zero. We had to lay off four people like that day, like as soon as we figured out what was going on, we laid off four people. And then over the next six weeks, we laid off every single other person or well, furloughed, I guess would be a better term. We laid off four and then furloughed everybody else. And, and so the summer, spring and summer of 2020 was touch and go. I thought we were going to lose the company altogether. We did manage to maintain, uh, you know, maintain. We lost, I mean, we lost a lot of money, yeah. um, lost, lost a lot of market position. Um, I lost a lot of sleep. So it was, it was a tough. So I, I ultimately made the decision to bring in a third party who was interested in acquiring the company. So that's, that's the transition I made. Okay. I mean, so now you're, you've built this, first of all, you wrote the book exit without exiting. How do people uh, get a hold of this book, by the way? Yeah. So you go to the real Jason Duncan.com slash book, the real Jason Duncan.com slash book. And you'll see a picture of this thing right here. And this is uh, my book about how to exit your business without selling it and begin living the exit lifestyle much sooner than you ever thought possible. You know, it's, it's a really, um, interesting dynamic when, you know, first of all, there's 80% of all businesses are owned by people that are in my generation, the baby boom generation and, uh, small businesses. And there's something like 15 million, excuse me, 18 million small businesses. But of that 18 million, the vast majority of them are really small businesses and not all of them are going to be able to sell their businesses. So the key is how do you preserve your legacy and allow it to continue to generate cash flow for you and your family. If something happens to you, or even if you just want to exit and retire from the business. And I think that's what you're focusing on, isn't it? Well, yes. And I ask, I ask prospects who reach out to me that say, I want to work with you or I want to be in your mastermind group. One of the questions I ask is, well, if you were unexpectedly hospitalized for 30 days and had no communication with your team, what would happen to your business? And the questions, the answers rather are all over the board. Some people say, well, you know, we'd probably stay in business, but we wouldn't grow. Yeah. Well, there would be a significant decline. Others say, hey, we'd go out of business within two weeks. But nobody says, yeah, it'd be great. It'd be fine. No problem. And and I realize there are businesses that would be fine in the in that event, but but most aren't. And the people that aren't are the ones who are calling me wanting help. I interviewed a guy on my podcast um, a couple of years ago, and his name is Dr. Sasha Becker. And he he may be a good guy for you to reach out. He doesn't do podcasts. Like I had to convince him. I'm very <laughs> persistent, but I convinced him. He's the he's one of only a handful of non-entrepreneurs I've had on my show, and I've done over 200 episodes. But I invited him on because he did a study in, uh, was it Denmark? Denmark, Norway, I don't know, somewhere in northern North Eastern Europe. Europe. Okay. But, but anyway, he did a study, a 15 year longitudinal study on the effects of businesses after the death of the founder. So it was really, really interesting about what they what they discovered about the significant reduction in revenue profitability and then businesses, of course, just closing. But there was a if I, I haven't looked up that study in a while, but I think it was a 46 percent permanent decline in profitability after the death of the founder. At least all those there's got to be at least I, I've seen this happen. The beauty of it is if you if they hire somebody like you or me to get involved with their exit planning ahead of that event, then they can prevent disaster. And that's really the key. It's planning for the unexpected as well as planning for your expected you know, departure from the business because you can't work forever. I'm 65 years old, Jason, and I've been working 
for 44 years as a professional. And what I've found is I'm not as sharp a tool as I used to be when I was in my 30s and 40s. I'm a lot more experienced. And I have that wisdom that I tried to categorize in my book. And I'm sure you've captured a lot of good stuff in your book too. And so the idea is that we know that at some point in time, our utility becomes less. And so we've got a plan for that and yet still have some balance in your life. I noticed that you've, uh, you said you're not only a family man, but you're also an adventurer who loves motorcycling, camping, and a, an occasional bourbon with a cigar. Well, I do the occasional bourbon, no cigars. Um, tell us a little bit about your family first, and we'll come back to the uh, exit planning stuff. So my beautiful wife and I have been married for almost 29 years. It'll be 29 years this year. And uh, we met on a blind date in high school. And uh, she went to a different school than I did. And, and uh, so we've been together uh, pretty much ever since. And um, we have two adult children. Our son's 23. Our daughter is 21. And um, we, we love to go RVN. We have a 34-foot long travel trailer that we travel the, travel the country in and go around. We haven't done as much over the past couple of years just because of business and everything else that's been going on. But, but you know, I, I, I used to travel all the time. And I would work from the road and I'd do podcasting from the road. It was really, really a lot of fun. But I also like to do motorcycling and I've got um, and my wife does some small day trips with me. But she doesn't do any long trips. We did a nine day trip last year on the Blue Ridge Parkway, went up toward, close to your neck of the woods, at least in the, you know, in the, uh, the, I guess the western side of the state. Yeah, but, um, very close. She goes, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> She's like, I'm never doing She doesn't like living on a motorcycle for a week and a half. Oh, but my I, gosh. I thoroughly love it. Well, you know, to each his own. I don't think I'd travel doing that either. I've got a client. That's a great story too. I have a guy. He's uh he had an electrical supply business, has an electrical supply business, and he loves riding motorcycles all over the world. So his second wife that he married also loves riding motorcycles. So they go on vacations. They go everywhere on a motorcycle. And this guy's older than I am. He's in his late sixties. I don't know how he does it. I, I think my my bottom would be a little sore after a while and I'd, my <laughs> back would be hurting and stuff like that. But in any event, so you mentioned your podcast. It's called The Root of All Success. Tell me yeah. a little bit about the podcast and what kind of insights the listeners can get on listening to The Root of All Success. Well, it's designed to explore uh, through interviews the stories of very successful entrepreneurs and what they define, how they define success. How do they become successful? Then how do they define it? And what I find is that there's this evolution of success from over time. You know, at the beginning, you know, they wanted Lamborghinis and yachts and stuff. And at the end, it's like, listen, I just want to be able to spend time as I choose with the people that I choose. Like that's that's success. That's really so we talk a lot about that. We talk about their keys to success. And then I let every guest finish with a, you know, their top advice. What's their top advice that they would give entrepreneurs who want to become successful? Well, we do the same thing here. So we're going to ask you some of those same questions as we, uh, as we navigate through this podcast today. Um, I noticed I haven't read your book and I'm going to get a copy of your book and read it. And maybe we'll have you back on to tell us about some more of the, uh, XOS, the, uh, exit operating system and exit, you know, exiting without exiting. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by that concept. I have a lot of clients who are currently in that mode, particularly family owned businesses. And the hard part is when does the founder want to get out? I have so many founder stories. I could tell you it would keep you, you know, listening for, <laughs> for hours and hours. But the interesting thing that I find is that a charismatic founder really hard to get them out of the business. They may say, well, yeah, I'm going to retire in five years. But they really may not mean it. Do you have any good founder stories that you want to share with us? Well, I think I think the idea conceptually is that most entrepreneurs are um, have a proclivity to be workaholics. They want to work more than what's healthy. And I think that's just natural in entrepreneurship. Me. Now, not everybody. I was just talking yeah. to a guy in Toronto. He owns a, a pawn shop and a spa. We were just, com you know, having a conversation about him coming into the mastermind. And I said, well, what do you want? Like, what are you trying to get to? And he goes, listen, I want to work two hours a day and vacation the rest of the time. Now that's a guy after my own heart. I, I would enjoy doing that, but I would get bored for a while. Like I could probably do that for a week or two or three, maybe a month, but I, I'd, I'd want to come back. But some people want to take it easy. Most people want to continue to work. 
But there, but there's a hidden danger in that because if you are the guy that runs the business and your charismatic personality and the business rises or falls upon your presence is that you've endangered the business. You've endangered your employees because if you get hit by the proverbial bus and you're no longer able to perform duties or you're dead, then your employees are all at jeopardy. And that's not what any charismatic great leader wants. They want their employees to be safe and to have have security. And so the best way that you can give them security is to pull yourself out of the business as much as possible. That doesn't mean you have to work less hours. It means the hours that you work have to be less important to the critical operations of the business. So this is a, let's go down this road a little bit because this is a great topic. How did you teach your managers to assume more responsibility and how were you able to extricate yourself from the business yet still be the owner? So again, I think it goes back to uh, what we talked about before and that is building tremendously good culture. I think that when you build a culture of excellence that you your, the cream rises to the top. And when you find those good people, you pour everything into them. And so I'm really proud to say that through that time of building the company, I had some great people and we, we really made some really good hires. We made some bad ones, but we made some good hires and we trained people and we put the right systems in place. And I learned delegation so that they could operate it when I didn't have to be there. Okay. And so that's really the trick. You've got to be able to do that. You've got to be able to focus on reclaiming your time by delegating tasks to your support squad and to your A team and let them handle it. And once that happens, you can then begin working on the systems, the automations. Then you can start working on building your company as a passive profits machine. And then you can work on becoming what I like to call the exit without exiting guy. So you can exit without exiting. And then that positions you to move to the final stage of selling you know, when you want at peak value. So let's talk about culture. When you talk about building a culture that um, people want to be there, they want to be at, at, you know, at work, they don't want to work. They may want to work remotely, which is, you know, becoming a, a thing today, which I'm okay with because as long as the people are productive and can be part of the culture, that's great. The, pro the thing I, I struggle with, with my clients and with, with our own firm is, can you really have a culture if people aren't there? But Tell us about how to build a culture. How can an entrepreneur build a successful culture that will allow for the business to run on its own and have transferable value? So I think, um, first of all, as a leader, we have to understand that a stream never rises above its source. So you're the, you're the culture setter. Like you have to set it. You're, you're the source of all things are going to happen. If there's confusion in the business, it's your fault. If there's great clarity in the business, it's your, your, it's to your credit. That's your job. There are really only three things that the founder of any business is supposed to be doing. Number one is to set the vision. That is the exclusively rele relegated to the founder of the business, the okay. architect of the business. Okay. Second is to communicate that vision. And that means to making sure that it's not just a good vision, but it's communicated on a regular and consistent basis in a consistent manner to all your people. And if that if that vision is communicated correctly, it continues to build and foster the culture that you want, assuming that the vision is clear. And then the third thing is that the founder is supposed to be doing is building the asset, building the asset. So set the vision, communicate the vision, build the asset. That's it. Outside of that, you shouldn't be doing anything else. So in setting the vision, communicating the vision to build the asset, you set a clear vision of a preferred future where you want everybody to go. And what does that look like? Everybody works for you for these, for three reasons, for opportunity, for recognition and money in that order. They want opportunity and they want to be recognized. And of course they want to get paid. But if you can set the vision and communicate it correctly, what you're doing is you're showing them the opportunity. And if they are helping you get to that vision, then you build the asset by recognizing them because they are the most valuable assets, your people. So if you can say to them, hey, this is where we're going. This is where I want to go. This is why it's important. And they're, yes, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And then you and then you see them help you get there. You recognize that. And, you, and so for, like little tactical things that I did is that once a month, we would shut the company down at Friday at noon once a month cater in a lunch, turn off the phones, even put the cell phones away. We'd have lunch, a catered lunch and we'd have a team meeting where I would address everybody for a minute or two. I'd do some sort of training. Um, 
and then each of my four department heads would get up and give a five to 10 minute like update on what's going on because the operations people don't know what the sales people are doing. Sales people don't know what the marketing people are doing. So like we, we talk about that and then we played games. Like literally we would play just something funny to build, build that culture. And then we'd kick off around two, two thirty, three o'clock in the afternoon. Everybody goes home. They got paid for the whole day, even though we didn't work. So we lose a day of productivity, but we build years of longevity. And that's Brilliant. just one small thing that we did. Brilliant ideas. Brilliant ideas. And do, do you think that your pastoral training and experience contributes to your success today? Um, yeah, I, I do. I think I think you look at people that have like I've got a degree, a bachelor's degree in biblical studies and ministry. I've got a master's degree in education. And you look at me over like I'm a business coach and an entrepreneur and I have six companies. What does that have to do with any of that stuff? Well, there's not a direct line, but there's certainly benefits that I get from knowing what it's like to be a pastor, be a leader, be a teacher, and even being a school teacher, navigating the, the navigating, dealing with 13, 14 year old kids. Like I, <laughs> I'm done. All that, all that prepared me to deal with people, especially employees. <laughs> well, so yeah, some of the, some of the employees act like 13 and 14 year olds, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting comment. I, you know, I think first of all, you and I have a lot in common. You're a lot younger, but you and I have a lot in common in that we both love to teach. And I think teaching is a great way of giving back, not just to the people that work for you, but also the entire community. You know, you can teach in school and you can offer, you know, seminars, uh, mo you know, uh, mastermind classes, all the things that you're doing are ways of giving back and ways of teaching. And if you're a good communicator, uh, people will really flock to you as not only as customers or clients, but also as employees and uh, mentees. And so you can be a great mentor over time. Is that something that you're doing with other entrepreneurs today? Tell us about your six companies, by the way, because well, I have a feeling that some of it's related. Yeah. Well, it, it, I mean, it's like anything else. You've got a holding company. You've got a company that does your debt. You got a management company. There's a, I got a couple of real estate holding companies, okay. uh, hard money lending company. So it's just, it's that type of stuff. So it's a small network. Now I'm, not, I'm in the process right now. I really am looking to buy a company. So it, it needs to be based in the Nashville area. So if you know anybody, I'm interested. Like, so I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a hint. I just had a guest on, which will appear before you appear, which is not going to be till July, but the, uh, the company that you should look up is a company called Acquira. A C Q U I R A. They're building a platform for people to buy small companies, small businesses, HVAC companies, plumbing, electrical, roofers, all kinds of stuff. It's very interesting. It's a, it's a disruptor to the business brokerage business. And, huh, uh, well, you'll, you should check it out. Well, uh, that and it's not an advertisement. Needs. I have no, you know, nothing to gain out of it other than the fact that I, it's another person that I know that I want to succeed. So, uh, check them out. Well, well, I will, uh, I will definitely do that. But I, I, um, you know, I, I do, I do want to invest in another business because I, one of the things I miss when you're running a coaching company, like I'm doing now, there's, there's no way to run this and not be the owner operator. Right. And the owner operator is the worst. Like in, I teach this. I mean, as a matter of fact, I'm speaking at an event next week. The title of my talk is why being an owner operator is the worst. There's owner operator, there's owner manager and owner investor. And, and my system teaches you how to move from owner operator to owner manager, ultimately to owner investor, where you can be prepared to exit when you're ready. But in a coaching business, there's no way to escape being owner operator. Now, the cool thing about it is that what I'm doing as a coach happens to be what I'm gifted at, the gifts that God has given me, and I'm exercising those. So I have joy, I have passion, I have, I have contentment, I have fulfillment in, in that. But here's, here's something I miss. One of the things I miss about running a, a, any other company like, like I have in the past is I miss building those systems and teams and people and, and teaching, even though it wasn't necessarily teaching, but teaching them how to, how to interact with customers, how to do those things. So um, part of what I want is I want to have an, have a business that I can invest in that I can move from. I don't know. I don't want to be operator at all. Please listen to be frank. I'll be <laughs> owner manager. That's where I'll start. But, but I want to move into that position of owner investor and have this business that I can work not just in or on, but above. I love it. I love the idea. I would, I'm a really good owner operator. I'm a lousy owner investor because I can't find people 
that are, that I believe are talented enough to replace me. And that's just my own ego. And that's just, that's a mistake. I think uh, all of us can be, are replaceable. We just have to trust the fact that people can actually step into our shoes and do what we do. And that's yeah. really the, the challenge for a lot of owner operators out there, a lot of yes. founders. And that's why it's really hard for them to break away. Um, any last advice for our listeners today before we break and uh, into another segment? Well, I think that what you were just referring to, I refer to that as the hero syndrome. And you know, the hero syndrome is when the owner believes that he is the hero of the business, that only he can put out the fires and save the day and rescue the damsel in distress and, and rescue the baby, whatever it happens to be. And, and that is true at the beginning. You know, the, the architect, the founder of the business is supposed to do three things. And this is it. Set the vision, communicate the vision, build the asset. hundred percent. That is a law. It's called the law of the architect. That's a universal law that's been around for ages. But in the beginning stages, building the asset means also doing the stuff, selling the thing, building the thing, whatever it is. Yeah. But most entrepreneurs never outgrow the hero syndrome. They continue to wear the cape and the cape drags them down. Yes, sir. And ultimately it devalues the business. It jeopardizes the livelihoods of the employees because now it's riding on you. If you don't show up, then nobody gets paid. I mean, how many times have un have entrepreneurs like didn't know how to make payroll and they're complaining about it? Well, it's probably because you created a system that relies on you and you backed off a little bit. And now you got a problem. So that's called the hero syndrome. And the first thing in any stage of moving towards any type of exit is we've got to break the hero syndrome. Well, I think this is great advice. And for those of you that are listening today, this is the real Jason Duncan, and he's got some really good advice. If people want to get in touch with you, they should go to therealjasonduncan.com, correct? That is it. And you can follow me on any of the social media platforms at the real Jason Duncan. And uh, read his book because I'm going to get it. It's going to teach me something. I always learn something whenever I read, and I don't know everything about exit planning. Um, and so Jason is going to teach me something in his book and it's called exit without exiting, which you can get through his website, Jason, it's really been a pleasure meeting you today. And I hope we uh, can stay connected because I think, uh, I think you're doing a great job and you're teaching a lot of really good principles to everybody. Well, thank you. Yeah, I need to, we need to get you in front of my mastermind group. We do a training call once a month and I always bring on experts that help people, prepare for an exit, prepare a business for scaling, et cetera. So maybe we could talk about what that might look like. I'll send you a copy of my book and you, you can pick what you want to talk about. Well, and we'll, we'll swap books. How about that? I love it. Thank you. And it's great having you on and, and uh, best of luck. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks, Jason. Uh, you've been listening to Jason Duncan on Blueprint for Wealth. And join us next time for a very special guest on Blueprint for Wealth. Have a great week. Thank you.